So we're continuing to go through the book of Romans. We took a break during the summer. We're back in the book of Romans now uh, for the fall, Romans 9 through 11. We're going to get into some uh, interesting things in the book of Romans 9 through 11 as we continue on. But I want to ask you today as we begin kind of a question to set up the discussion we're going to have over the next several weeks. And here's the question. Why does one person reject the gospel and another person believes? Why does one person reject the gospel and another person believes the gospel? It's a deeply personal question. It's one oftentimes that parents and grandparents ask about their children. Tim and Glenda Smith uh, were asking that very question about their fraternal twin boys, Evan and Jerry. They were born literally five minutes apart, and they grew up as the closest of friends Uh, Both Evan and Jerry grew up in a church where the gospel, the message of the Bible, was regularly taught. Um, They both attended Sunday school and youth group, but in their college years, their faith journeys widely departed. Evan eventually became a pastor, and Jerry became an avowed atheist. As Glenda and Tim thought about their their children and that twist in their lives, they wondered, uh, why did Evan embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but Jerry rejected Jesus? It's kind of the fundamental question that a lot of us ask, maybe even of ourselves. Why does one person embrace the gospel and another reject the gospel? That's actually the fundamental question that Paul's asking now in Romans uh, 9 through 11. As he thinks about his own life, maybe if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that he was a man, uh, a Pharisee, who at one point in his life was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He, was, he rejected openly Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And then one day he, he met him, the risen Christ, on the road to Damascus. And from that point he embraced the gospel and started living for him. But many of his own countrymen, many of his Jewish relatives rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And Paul is asking that question, why did one Jewish person embrace the gospel and another one openly reject it? It's the question he's asking as he begins in Romans chapter 9. Hear the word of God in Romans chapter 9 and verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for the sake of my people, those of my race, the people of Israel. This burning question is in his mind, why did so many of his people, the Jewish people, reject Jesus as Messiah? It's a personal question for him. And he even says, if it were possible, I would be cut off from Christ so that they could be grafted in, if it's possible. We knew it wasn't possible, but he was was just saying, how is it? Why is it? Why did so many reject Christ? That's the burning question that Paul is asking that informs the whole chapters, 9 through 11. That question continues in chapter 10 in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He's saying, why aren't they? I want them to be saved. He says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. And then in chapter 11, verse 1, to remind us again of the problem that he's wrestling with. Why did one person reject the gospel and another embrace the gospel? He says in chapter 11, verse 1, I ask then, did God reject his people? Was it God's fault? He's asking in Romans chapter 11. So he's wrestling with this question. Why does one person believe and another reject the gospel? Why is that? Paul's going to try and answer that for us over the course of several weeks as we work our way through Romans chapter 9. Today we're going to take a dive into it, and then next week on the outdoor service, we're not going to dive into deep waters like that, you know, but then we'll come back again and swim in the waters and think a little bit about that question. It's a big question, but I want to ask it at two levels. One is, why do I embrace the gospel if you're a believer? And if you're not, I want you to ask yourself, why is it that I, I don't? It's a deeply personal question that each one of us should try and understand. But one thing is clear. Paul is making it clear 
that whatever he's talking about is not the same thing as religion. He's trying to make it clear to us that it's not religion but faith that saves us. Paul is making it clear that he's asking this question about deeply religious people, but he knows that even in their deep religiosity, something's missing in their life. It's not religion that saves us. I want to communicate to you, and I think this is what the Apostle Paul is communicating in these books, that religious observance is good. Okay, It's good to come to church. Don't, don't get the wrong message. The deacons will get mad at me if I tell you that religion is not... It's good. It's good to come to church. But religious observance is good, but I need to be very clear with you. It doesn't save you. Coming to this church, coming to any church regularly doesn't save you. It doesn't make you right with God. Saving faith is what ultimately puts us into a relationship with God. But saving faith doesn't trust in our religious observance. It's in God's provision in Christ that saves us. We don't have faith in ourselves, in our religion. We have faith in Christ. That's what saves us. And Paul wants us to understand that because that's at the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem was that the Jewish people, of which he was one, of which he was guilty of, were putting their faith in their religious observance. Now, in Paul's day, many people believed that you would be made right with God simply by being religious. You think that's still true today? I think a lot of people believe that if I just do enough good, I have a religious checklist, and I just check off some of these things. Yeah, you know, four out of five. Yeah, two out of three. You know, I'm okay. Well, I think that's what Paul believed many of the religious people of his day, and even at one time he himself was guilty of. Notice what he says. He, he points out that religious observance is not the same as saving faith. Look at what he says in verse 4, chapter 9, verse 4. Talking about the people of Israel, he says, Theirs is the adoptions to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. I mean, these Jewish people that Paul was a part of, they had the ultimate in religious expression. They had a temple that was in Jesus' day, as Paul was writing, was still existing today, that was refurbished by you know, by the great pilot, and it was uh, uh, Herod, and it was this great edifice, this great temple, and you would go in and you would give your religious offering, and, and it was magnificent and beautiful, and, you know, if there were pipe organs in those days, it would have been playing softly in the background, and there would have been this golden edifice, and it was just amazing. It was religious observance at its best, but it didn't save them. Paul goes on to say in chapter 10, verse 2, For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. I, I have to acknowledge to you, I, I, when I sometimes see other religions in the world and practices in the world, I say, they are more zealous than me. I mean, there are religious people that will, you know, crawl on their knees or, you know, over long distances, and they will do certain religious observances, and I'm like... Far more zealous than me. But that zeal doesn't save. That's the problem. Part of the answer to why one rejects the gospel and another believes is, is because some of us have a wrong idea of what saves us. We, we, we think we, we're saved by our efforts. Religious observance is not the same as saving faith. The other thing Paul says is that religious heritage is not the same as saving faith. Looking back at verse chapter 9, verse 5, he says... Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever. Amen. The Jews had the, the, the DNA, religious DNA. I mean, they could trace themselves back to Abraham, trace themselves back through Moses, back through Jacob and Israel, and, and their name, the Israelites, was traced to a particular person. Sometimes people think, when you ask them, well, are you a Christian? They say, well, I was raised a Christian. I'm in a Christian nation. And all that may be true at one level. In name, we may be Christian. But that religious heritage is not the same as saving faith. Paul, Paul understood that many people in his day, just like in our day, 
put their faith in their religious observance or their religious heritage as if they think that saves them. It, it doesn't. The Bible says it doesn't. So as Paul is addressing this issue of why one person rejects the gospel and another person embraces the gospel, Romans 9-11, through 11, he's going to really open up a can of worms. Okay, so, so he's going to open up a can of worms. And, 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 and I'm just going to give you a little brief overview today, and we're going to dive into it much more in two weeks. But what the Apostle Paul is going to say to us is, to the question of why one person believes and one doesn't, he says, remember, and this is my analogy, remember there's two sides of the coin to this question. On the one side of the coin, we have to look at the response of every human being to the gospel. There's a human response required in the gospel. We're going to see today that the reason that the religious Jews of Jesus' day and of Paul's day did not believe in him was partly because they refused to believe. The reason people don't believe today is because they refuse. That's one side of the coin, human responsibility. Paul will go through that. Our response to salvation, to the gospel message, is so important. But Paul will also flip the side of the coin and we'll wrestle with it and we'll dive deep into the waters in 9 through 11 where we'll say that also God has a role in salvation. God has a role in drawing us to Him. So part of the answer will be they didn't respond and God did not draw. It's going to be the dynamic, the tension that we're going to deal with in Scripture. But here's the reality. Scripture acknowledges both. It doesn't hide from it. It gives the answer that both it is the response of the human being and also the call and election of God that brings about that process of change we call conversion and embracing the gospel. Both of those are true. And we don't have to hide from saying they're both true. We may not understand them both. We may not understand how it all relates, but we can acknowledge them both as true. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon was asked how he reconciled divine sovereignty and human responsibility, and he replied, I never try to reconcile friends. They're both in Scripture. I don't have to try and explain away one to prove the other. I just simply acknowledge that they're both there. So I would say to the question of how does anyone believe, it is both the response of your heart and the movement of God in your life, it's both end rather than either or. Embrace the mystery of it. But more importantly, move to it. Move through it. Let God change you. We sang the song, I am the potter. You, know, you are the potter. I'm the clay. Mold me, make me, shape me. That's what God has to do that work in us. But we have to respond. It's both end rather than either or. Part of the problem is, so we think about this is we have a hard time grappling with that kind of mystery of how God has to do it in our lives and how we have to do it, right? At the same time, we have to respond to the move of God in faith, and yet God has to move. How do we wrestle that, right? We struggle with that. We say, how could God be in control and how could I be free? Well, let me just remind you of one important distinction. It's the distinction between freedom and autonomy. You are free... Let's think about driving a car. Are you free to drive in this country any car you want? Any color? Any type? SUV? Compact? You know, truck? Diesel? Right? Whatever. Electric? You can choose. You are free to choose the car of your dreams. But you're not autonomous on the road, are you? There's certain rules. There's certain restrictions. Try to drive down the street the wrong way. Well, don't. No, really don't. Because you'll, you'll hurt somebody. But, you know, try and go over the speed limit. Now, in New Jersey, I would say, really go over the speed limit on the Garden State Parkway and see what happens. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's another story. Um, but so there's great freedom that I have. But my freedom is, is constrained in some ways, right? I'm not autonomous. I can't make up the rules. Well, in the same way, when we think about God's sovereignty and human freedom, I would say that we are free in many ways, and yet we are also constrained by God's sovereignty. Both can be true at the same time. I can be free, but there is also an overarching rule. It's called God's sovereignty, just like there's New Jersey traffic laws, right? 
Think of it that way. Here's another analogy that I think helps us. How many of you play chess? Anybody? Okay, got some chess players. Uh, do you, got some in the back here, too. Okay, maybe some of you online. Um, have you heard of um, Abanayu Mishra? Huh? Anybody? He is now the youngest grandmaster chess player of all time. He's a New Jersey resident. He just recently was named the grandmaster, one of the grandmasters. Now, let me ask you, those of you that play pretty good chess, can you defeat the grandmaster in chess? Any chance, you think? <laughs> Could be. Doesn't sound very convinced. I'm going to suggest, uh, if I can just politely say, there ain't no chance. Okay? Now, here's the reason why. Here's what I would say. You are free to move anywhere you want on the board, right? You have freedom, not, not autonomy, right? You can't make up the rules. You have to play by the rules. But you're free to move anywhere on the board. In fact, you make the first move, right? He lets you make the first move. Is there any chance that he's going to lose the game? And you might say, if you think about it, you might be, no, nah, there's no chance. Why? Is it because you're not free to choose and to move on the, the board? No, of course. You're free to move anywhere on the board within the bounds of the rules. The reason why Abanayu will, uh, uh, Ab I'm sorry, will win is because, I'm going to use the analogy, he is sovereign over that board of chess. Sovereignty in this case does not mean forcing you as a robot or a puppet to move, but within your freedom, he is so much more knowledgeable about that game of chess. He is might call it all knowledgeable about that game. He is all powerful about that game. So whatever move you make, he can still move in a way to accomplish his will, which is to checkmate you. There's freedom. Freedom. You can move anywhere you want. But there's sovereignty. You're going to lose. The, the will of the grandmaster is going to be accomplished. And I think that's a helpful analogy for us to think about how God can give us freedom in life, but also be sovereign over the board of life, the game of life, the globe, and he can even announce ahead of time his will. But yet we're free. In that way, I think we can understand that tension between sovereignty, God's sovereignty, and human freedom. But let's get back to the question at hand. Why did many, so many of the Jews of Paul's day reject the gospel? Well, back to the one side of the coin, human responsibility, Paul answers the question, it says, because they rejected the gospel. But here's why they rejected the gospel. Because they were trusting in their own religious observance, their own religious heritage, instead of the gospel. See, far too often, it's not that we just outright reject the gospel. We reject the gospel for a false gospel. We think we can save ourselves. We don't think we need God's salvation. Our faith is in ourselves. And so religious observance is good, but it does not save us. It does not save us. Saving faith doesn't trust in our religious observance, but solely in God's provision in Christ for us. And the Apostle Paul, when he explains the problem of why the Jews rejected the gospel in large, is because they refused to trust in the righteousness that was offered to them through Christ alone and trusted in their own righteousness. And that same error can be made by us today. Notice what the Apostle Paul says as we read that text again. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel, his own people, who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. What he's saying is, is that the human responsibility side of the coin, the reason they rejected the gospel is because they were pursuing the law the Ten Commandments, all the laws, the 600 laws of the Old Testament, they were pursuing that in a way to justify themselves, to make themselves right with God. They thought, if I just do all the commandments, 
that I'll be okay with God. The problem is no one can fulfill all the commandments of God. No one can fulfill it. And so they were trying to justify themselves through the law. They didn't attain their goal, he says. Why not, he asks in verse 32, because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They were trusting in their own works. They were, they were ready to go before the throne of God. And when God says, why will, you let, why will I let you into heaven? And they were going to have a whole list of their religious observance and religious heritage and say, isn't this enough? And God was going to say on that day and would say on that day, no, it's not. We're not made right by our religious observance. And he says, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. The reason that the, many of the unbelieving Jews of Paul's day did not believe in Jesus as he believed in Jesus was because they stumbled over Jesus. This analogy of a stumbling stone means that God presented Jesus Christ to the world. He presented the Messiah to the people of Israel. But here's the problem. The Messiah that God presented to the people of Israel was not this glorious reigning king. He was a suffering servant who was murdered on a cross. And to the Jewish mind, that was a stumbling block. How can I believe in the Messiah who was crucified? It makes no sense, they said. They didn't understand the reason he was crucified was for our sins. They didn't understand Isaiah 53. By his wounds we are healed. For our iniquities he was put on the cross. They, they, they stumbled over the very one who was given to them for their salvation. Instead of trusting in their salvation through Jesus Christ and what he did, they stumbled over him. He became a stumbling stone. Instead of trusting in him, they trusted in themselves. The Bible says that anyone who believes in Jesus will not be put to shame, but anyone who rejects him is stumbling over the very means of our salvation. He goes on in chapter 10 and verse 1 to say, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Paul's recognizing that at this point they're still not saved. Why? Because they're not trusting in Christ. They're trusting in themselves and their own religion. He says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. The gospel brings knowledge to us. It calls for a response. Here's what the gospel says to us. The gospel says you are far worse than you ever thought you were, that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God, far worse than you ever thought. But at the same time, the gospel says, but you're far more loved than you could ever imagine. But we have to learn to accept that part of the gospel that says, I can't save myself. I can't trust in myself. We stumble over that at times. But if we, if we can accept and embrace that what Jesus has done, he becomes the cornerstone, not a stumbling stone. He becomes the rock upon which we build our life, right? We sing that, you know, the song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We it, those of us who understand our state come to Jesus and we rest on him like a, a foundation stone. We know that our foundation for hope and eternity is not ourselves, but in Jesus and him alone. We trust in him. But Paul says, since they didn't know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, that phrase is so important, to those who don't know that God has offered them a gift of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And in dying on the cross for our sins, all of our sins were placed on his shoulders. And as he hung on that cross, the penalty for our sins was placed upon him. And, and, and the Bible says that's God's gift to us. The righteousness of Christ is given to us by faith. Our sins are placed on Jesus. That's the gift of the gospel. That's the gift of righteousness. But if we don't know that, if we don't believe that, then what are we going to do? We're going to trust in our own righteousness. We're going to think, I can just do a little bit more and earn a little bit more, and eventually I'll get there, but we never will. They sought to establish their own righteousness. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Part of the human response to the gospel is humbling ourselves to say, 
I cannot save myself. Each one of us has to come to that moment in time where we understand that. And when we do, then we're able to come to the moment where we say, but Christ, but Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I know that Christ was given so that I could be saved because His death on the cross takes away the burden of my sin and the penalty of my sin. And His righteousness is given to me by faith. So we look to Christ, we turn from ourselves and trusting in ourselves and we turn to Christ as the only means of salvation. See, the problem with the unbelieving Jews of Paul's day and the problem with many in our day is if we pursue salvation by works as a self-righteousness, we'll never get there. We'll never get there. We'll fail to see that Christ should be the object of our faith. That His death, His resurrection, His ascension, what He did for us is what we put our hope in, not ourselves. But the Bible is clear that the good news is that those who receive salvation by faith alone, who embrace it as a gift, who say, oh God, I could never do this for myself, but you give this to me as a gift and I receive it by faith, that those who embrace it by faith are the saved, the ones who trust in Christ as the only grounds of their salvation. That is the response that God is seeking, a response of faith to the good news of the gospel. So let me ask you as we close today, have you embraced the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which is this, although you are a sinner and subject to God's judgment, God sent his son to be judged in your place and to receive the full weight of the penalty of your sins and believing in him and trusting in him who died for you and paid the penalty for your sins, that by believing and trusting in him, that you will be saved and you trust in the work that he's done for you. That's the gospel. Let me ask you, is that what you believe? Or are you still trusting in yourself? It's the heart of the question. It's the heart of whether or not we embrace or reject the gospel. Religious observance is good. Come on back. But it's not going to save you. Saving faith is only trusting in Christ as the means of your salvation solely in what God has done. Is that where your hope and your faith is? Not in yourself, but in Christ alone. Let's pray. God, we come to you today and we uh, thank you for your word which speaks to us and focuses us on what is truly the most important question. The most important question is, in whom am I trusting? Am I trusting in myself and my performance? Or am I trusting in Christ and His performance for me? So Lord, I pray that each person here today would consider that question in their heart and that Your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us and help us to see the condition of our heart. Am I trusting in myself for salvation? Or am I, have I transferred all my trust to Christ and Him alone for my salvation? I pray, Lord, that you make that clear to us today, each one of us, and that we would respond with saving faith, which says, I don't trust in my own righteousness. I trust in the righteousness of Christ as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.